have people out here. We have all these people, women, children, tiny babies. These men came in here and they started firing on us. The boats came through the walls and people were killed, people were injured. And it, this is a miracle. In February 1993, the United States witnessed one of the most notorious and controversial standoffs in American history. For 51 days, federal agents surrounded a compound in Waco, Texas, housing the Branch Davidians, a cult-like religious group hoping to capture its leader, David Koresh. But the situation quickly spiraled out of control, leading to a tragic turn of events that left dozens of people, including women and children, dead. But at the core of the Waco massacre were the Branch Davidians. The history of the Branch Davidians is a long and complicated one, but the group involved in the Waco incident was founded when Benjamin Roden, a member of the then-popular Davidian Seventh-day Adventists, became dissatisfied with the former group's leadership. So, Roden broke off from the group and founded the Branch Davidians, claiming that he was the one sent by God to deliver a biblical message. They made their headquarters on a 941-acre property named Mount Carmel, in the countryside of Waco, Texas. This group decided to isolate themselves from the city as they wanted to avoid all the corruption of modern-day society. But despite being an offshoot of the Davidian Seventh-day Adventists, the Branch Davidians retain most of their traditions. Worship on Saturday, vegetarianism, and the belief of Christ's imminent return, or the Apocalypse. But when Rodin, the founder of the group, died in 1978, and it was his son's turn to step in as leader, a young new convert, Vernon Howell, who'd been leading Bible study at Mount Carmel, started rising in popularity with the Davidians. What ensued was a power struggle between Howell and George Roden. At first, Howell was forced out of Mount Carmel at gunpoint by Roden, at which point Howell settled in Palestine, Texas. It was around this time that he put his musical skills to use, making a song called Madman in Waco, referring to Roden. At that time, it's said that most of the group at Mount Carmel favored Howell over Rodin, so in an unhinged attempt to regain popularity, Rodin exhumed a grave and challenged Howell to resurrect the body. Ignoring this, Howell began to research what laws Rodin might be breaking and went to the police claiming that Rodin had engaged in corpse abuse. But the police refused to act, telling Howell that he needed a picture or some type of evidence for the case to go forward. So, Howell and some of his followers marched onto the Mount Carmel site with rifles and shotguns for what they claimed was just a visit to get the evidence the police wanted. Curiously, they didn't think to bring a camera. Rodin, seeing Howell stroll up to his compound with arms, got an Uzi of his own, and what ensued was a shootout, a mistrial, an unrelated murder, and the eventual confinement of Rodin to a psychiatric hospital, where he was later judged insane. Now, with a power vacuum at Mount Carmel and the support of the commune, Howell finally assumed leadership, and with his newfound influence, he could start spreading his own ideals to the Branch Davidians. Vernon Howell grew up in Houston, Texas to a dysfunctional family. His mother had him when she was only 14 years old and he didn't meet his biological father until he was 17. In his childhood, he was put into a special ed class as he lacked proficiency in studying or reading due to his dyslexia. Despite this, in his teenage years, Howell started studying the Bible and joined his mother's church, the Seventh-day Adventists, before being kicked out for butting heads with church leaders. A few years later, most likely after searching for another Adventist church he could join, Howell came to Mount Carmel. At first, he would write and sing songs in church services, as he'd been interested in music since childhood. However, Howell had a particular talent for explaining and interpreting the Bible to other people. So, as he found himself the leader of the Branch Davidians, he had free reign to teach his own ideals. In that book of the things he has made concerning his his tongue is the pin of One of his first orders of business was changing his name to David Koresh, a more biblically appropriate name. From now on, we'll refer to him as David Koresh. Now, the Birch Davidians under George Roden's leadership had been taught that instead of the Trinity made up of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, there was a family made up of the Father, the Mother, and the Son. However, when David Koresh took over, he altered it even further, teaching that God was made up of two halves, a father and a mother figure, and that occasionally the father takes on flesh, meaning he projects himself into the body of a human. 
He says that 2,000 years ago, the Father projected himself into Jesus Christ, and when Christ went back up to heaven, he became the Father again. In this sense, Christ and God are one and the same. While Koresh never explicitly taught that he was Christ, his followers came to think of him as the Messiah figure, predicted for the end of times. However, not everyone saw David Koresh or the Branch Davidians as a force of good, and some spoke up about his questionable leadership. In February 1993, a newspaper series titled The Sinful Messiah started publishing articles breaking down Koresh's character and alleging child abuse and the stockpiling of weapons. According to its various installments, Koresh started preaching that he was entitled to 60 wives and 80 concubines, as described in the Bible's Song of Solomon. He later said that all the women in the commune, including married women, were now his wives, and that the men were to stay celibate. This strict prophecy included children. In fact, even before Koresh had taken leadership of the group, he'd married the 14-year-old Rachel Jones. This was technically legal at the time in Texas, as her parents had agreed to it. Later, Koresh felt inclined to wife Rachel's younger sister as well, and again after that, 10-year-old Kiri Jewell. Kiri was later questioned about her situation. Were you ever uh, given a religious rationale for the... was it ongoing with the little girls and the complex? Was there a reason given? The only thing I remember was that he would say that King David from the Bible it was also recounted that Koresh would spank or hit children when they broke rules. But it wasn't only abuse. Koresh and the group, now seen as a cult to the public, had been accused of stockpiling weapons. In fact, this was the main reason authorities decided to raid Mount Carmel in the first place. They were convinced the cult was illegally converting semi-automatic weapons into fully automatic ones, as Koresh had been ordering gun magazines, explosive devices, and various gun parts. As authorities saw more and more firearms being delivered to the Mount Carmel location, they decided it was best to investigate the Branch Davidians' operations. So, a few months before the raid, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, or the ATF, started undercover surveillance in a house across the street. One of these undercover agents, Robert Rodriguez, introduced himself to the Davidians as a college student, but Koresh quickly found him out. Even still, Koresh allowed Robert to attend Bible studies, believing that he could convert Robert, even if he was working for the ATF. You know, Robert, you know, I was going to let him stay here with me for two weeks. Mm -hmm. He could have lived right here with me. He could have, he could have discovered everything. After finding out that Koresh had been tipped off that the ATF would be coming that day, Robert, quote, jumped into his truck and was honking his horn all the way up the Mount Carmel driveway. Apparently, he drove all the way to the staging area to try to get the ATF to call off the raid. But it was too late. The ATF, using a search warrant they'd obtained, were already on their way to investigate the compound. At around 9.45 a.m. on February 28, 1993, three National Guard helicopters started circling the compound, and trucks and civilian vehicles filled with ATF agents started pulling up. Inside the compound, Koresh had instructed all women and children to stay in their rooms, and said that he'd go outside and talk to the agents himself. So, Koresh walked outside and allegedly said, Hey, wait a minute, there are women and children in here. At which point, shots were exchanged between the two sides. Now, it's important to mention that both sides, the ATF and the Davidians, claimed that the other side had shot first, and they were just defending themselves. However, the prevailing theory, or the theory I saw the most while researching this topic, is that the ATF had fired the first shots, only aiming to kill Koresh's dogs. But hearing that shots had been fired, the rest of the agents opened fire at the compound, at which point the Davidians returned fire. Regardless of who fired the first shot, a gunfight ensued. Koresh was immediately shot in the stomach and wrist. At the same time, a Davidian named Wayne Martin from inside the compound called 911. 911, what's your emergency? 911, what's your emergency? There are men, 75 men around our building. Okay, just, just a moment. This Hello? Hello? There's 75 men circling. Hello? 
Hello. Hello. Yeah, this is Lieutenant Lynch. May I help you? Yeah, the 75 men around our building, and they're shooting at us in Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel? Yeah, tell them there are children and women in here, and to call it off. All right, all right. Uh, hello? I hear gunfire. Oh, shit. Hello? Oh, my. But eventually, the two lose contact, and the sheriff tries to call Wayne back. <laughs> The two regain contact again, and the sheriff tries to organize a ceasefire. Okay, Wayne, cease firing. Do not fire anymore. Okay? I have a right to defend myself, and it's not in firing first! Okay, well, let's resolve it. Let's not, let's resolve this, Wayne, before someone gets... At one point, agents had climbed up to the second floor of the compound and had gotten inside through a window to reach where they believed a stash of firearms were hidden but they later came running out as a hail of bullets followed them. Eventually, the sheriff, Larry Lynch, called the Davidians in the ATF and organized a ceasefire. The whole shootout lasted around two hours, which took the lives of four ATF agents and five branch Davidians. And so, as things started to calm down, the two-month-long siege at Mount Carmel officially commenced. <laughs> At this point, the FBI took over the situation, seeing as the ATF had already done enough damage. With the FBI came two groups, the Hostage Rescue Team, or HRT, and the FBI Negotiators, both of which butt heads during the operation. The HRT were thought of as more careless, and had more of a guns blazing approach to the situation. A former Davidian described them as, They had an attitude, we need to beat the heck out of them, get even for our brothers who got hurt. That came across in their actions. On the other hand, the negotiators, from the Davidians' perspective, were seen as professional liars. I could see their double talk and broken promises, and I wasn't interested. So, it wasn't looking too good for the FBI. Over at the Davidian compound though, the first thing they attempted was to contact local news media to get their message out. But the FBI quickly cut all communication the Davidians had with the outside world, and instead established a phone line connecting Koresh with the negotiators. The main negotiator and the one who could talk to Koresh the most was Jim Cavanaugh, an ATF agent. I understand that. I, I, I really. I, how can we come to an agreement? And how can we get back to where we were yesterday and start moving? Some well, of the like I said, you're dealing with your bosses. I'm dealing with my father now. Right. And y'all can go ahead and laugh. I'm not laughing. And stand then. back and ridicule. At this point, the FBI's goal was to get all of the Davidians out of the compound. After talking with Koresh for a few hours, he demanded that he be able to broadcast his religious teachings over the radio before anyone would come out of the compound. Kavanaugh and Koresh then agreed that if his demand was fulfilled, he would send a few children out. So, at around 4 p.m. on the first day of the siege, his broadcast was played and replayed a couple times on Dallas radio, before the first four children were sent out. The next day, on March 1st, word was getting back to Washington about what had happened in Waco, and wanting to preserve their image, the FBI was ordered to avoid any exchange of gunfire with the Davidians unless there was a threat of imminent bodily harm. During the course of the day, ten more children were sent out, and Koresh had said that if an audio tape of his Bible studies was played on the Christian Broadcasting Network, everyone, including himself, would leave the compound. So, the next day, Koresh's audio tape was played, but no one came out. When asked why, Koresh said that God had told him to wait. This is the United States of America. And we may be just chalked up as one more cult group. Not to me or not. But there are seven seals. And as long as you do not permit me to show I you... I did permit you. We'd let you play your tape for an hour. And wait, a minute, wait 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 a minute. Okay. What did you learn from that tape? I, one thing I learned is you let me down, you didn't keep your word. You weren't listening to the truth anyway. We've told you, you're not going to come here and push your little ATF butt around. We are Americans too. One of the fears that the FBI had was that the Davidians would commit mass suicide inside the compound. And although Koresh had denied multiple times that they would ever do this, it was still a lingering thought in the back of the agents' minds. 
Nevertheless, a few days later, Koresh sent out a videotape showing his wounds and his children. Yeah, we just thought we'd kind of break the ice and allow people to see just exactly, you know, what kind of people we have here. I'd like to start off first of all with my oldest son. His name is Cyrus. How old are you? Seven. Seven. Say hello to everybody. Hi. Where you at him? There's a camera right there. At this point, it was becoming clear that Koresh and his closest followers had little intention of surrendering. So, the HRT decided to try and make things less bearable for the Davidians, hopefully driving them out. The HRT ordered that all electrical power inside the compound be shut off, angering the Davidians even more. This is where the gap between the HRT and the negotiators started widening, as the negotiators thought this move was counterproductive to their efforts. So, in an attempt to gain back the trust of the Davidians, the negotiators made it clear this was not their idea. On March 14th, with negotiations at a standstill, the FBI decided to increase the pressure, in what they called stress escalation. In the night, bright lights were focused on the compound, and the negotiators were told to insist on a peaceful resolution but not to listen to any more of what they called Bible talk from Koresh. Later, audio tapes of the Davidians who had come out were played on a loudspeaker, urging those who remained to surrender. And in the following days, the loudspeakers would be used to play loud music, Tibetan chants, and Christmas carols in an attempt to make the Davidians as uncomfortable as possible. Because of this, Steve Schneider, Koresh's right-hand man, told a negotiator, Koresh just told me now. He said no one is coming out. Nobody. From this point on, negotiations were at a standstill. No good progress was being made, and it had been around a month since the siege started. So, the HRT decided to discuss different stress escalation measures they could take to drive the Davidians out of the compound. A full-out assault was out of the question, as agents had already suffered heavy casualties and a surprise attack was nearly impossible because of the layout of the compound. So, another plan was drawn up. The FBI theorized that if they introduced non-lethal tear gas into certain parts of the compound, they could force the Davidians to evacuate. According to the FBI, all aspects of the plan had been accounted for, including the risk of Davidians becoming hostile after evacuating, them using children as human shields, and the risk of mass suicide. So, on April 18th, a day before the plan was set to be executed, the FBI started clearing the compound surroundings of any vehicles or obstructions. Of course, the FBI kept the plan a secret from the Davidians and said that the clearing of vehicles were just for safety purposes. The next morning, at around 5.55 a.m., the FBI began the operation. Two tanks carrying a Mark V liquid injection system filled with tear gas were driven to the compound and positioned at the first floor windows. They were then instructed to deliver two bottles of tear gas and wait for further instructions. At the same time, an FBI agent called the compound to try and explain what was going on. Around 10 minutes into the operation, the FBI reported gunfire hitting one of the tanks, and in response, they escalated the gassing operation. But, as they made it very clear in a Department of Justice report, the FBI didn't return fire. Back in the compound, the Davidians were scrambling to put their gas masks on. Some grabbed helmets or jackets to cover their skin. As one survivor put it, grown men were almost in tears from the gas getting on their bare skin. After around half an hour of continued pressure, the HRT reported that the entire building was gassed and for the tanks to return to be refueled. This is where the plan started getting out of hand. At around 12 p.m., seven hours after the gassing started, it seemed as if a fire had broken out on the second floor of the compound. Exactly one minute later, a second fire broke out on the first floor, and one minute after that, a third fire was detected on the right side of the building. Aerial infrared surveillance showed that these fires spread rapidly, in part because of the weather that day, as wind was thought to be fanning the flames. In less than 40 seconds after the fires had started, it had engulfed both the compound's chapel and gymnasium, and around four minutes later, the entire compound was on fire. A survivor who was inside the compound at the time said he didn't notice a fire had started until black smoke engulfed the room where he and others had been hiding. The pressure was so much that you did not consciously think it would be a good idea to get down on the floor where the air was cleaner. It forced you down, like you got hit with a 200-pound sack of flour. In the compound, the decision was made to put all the women and children in a concrete bunker to protect them from the elements. But instead of doing this, the room turned into a cul-de-sac with no ventilation, and most Davidians who entered the bunker didn't come out. At around 1 p.m., the fire had begun to burn out, leaving the entire compound leveled. During the fire, only 9 of the 85 people escaped the compound. 
Most were wearing gun holsters, had burned body parts, and some were wearing gas masks. The Davidians who remained inside the compound were all found deceased. Most had died due to carbon monoxide or smoke inhalation, while others were buried by rubble or shot. In fact, David Koresh was found with a gunshot wound to the head. It's unknown whether it was self-inflicted or not, but the FBI theorizes that David Schneider, Koresh's right-hand man, had killed Koresh before killing himself as well. Whether this was voluntary for Koresh is unknown. After the whole ordeal, the FBI maintains that the Davidians could have escaped if they wanted to, but waited too long. Next, what's your comment? You know, regardless of how this investigation is going to uh, turn out about who really lit the fire, the people that really lit the fire, and there are millions of us out here that believe this, was the ATF. Are they really, is the ATF really so stupid that they don't realize that any time you treat people like cornered rats by blasting in music at night or surrounding them with... As you can probably imagine, word of this massacre had quickly spread throughout the country, and within 24 hours, everyone had their own opinion on what happened. Now, it's impossible to go through every piece of controversy surrounding the massacre, but these are the most talked about. Some say that the affidavit that led to the raid in Waco was full of faulty information. Others say that the ATF's prime reason for suspicion was about gun violations, so putting allegations about children in the affidavit was only an attempt to inflame the case against Koresh. ...stated that uh, there's a lot of surplus, uh, there's a lot of inflammatory material in the warrant that, while it is terrible to read, just like it was terrible to listen to, has little to do with federal law enforcement uh, and is certainly outside of the scope of the jurisdiction of the agency that was trying to get the warrant. How could sexual information, possibly if left out, have anything to do with a firearms charge? It could. Okay. It's irrelevant. I, even some of the firearms information, for example, there's a quote that's referred to at least, uh, at least once, I think twice, of, of a child who, was, who had been living in the compound who said, I hope to grow up because then I can practice with long guns like adults. Do either of you know of a federal offense in practicing with long guns by adults? It, it, it's not just that it's irrelevant, it's inflammatory. It, was, it wasn't mistakenly put in there, someone intentionally put that in there in the hopes that that would move a, a judge. And on the other side of the spectrum, some blame Koresh entirely. David Koresh is ultimately to blame for the horror of Waco, no matter how others seek to twist and revise history. This is a... Uh, an AK-47 rifle that's converted into a machine gun. Let me ask you, Mr. Yan, do you have any doubt, any doubt, that there were illegally converted machine guns like this in the Davidian compound? None whatsoever. In fact, we found two, one in a car and one in the ashes, both of which still fired. When my mother and I first joined David Koresh, he was still Vernon Howell, and his group was living in a little two-bedroom house in San Bernardino, California. I was five or six. We lived with a group off and on there and in Pomona, California. As we've combed through countless testimonies, both sides seem quick to blame each other for taking responsibility of the first shot. And since there is so much contradicting information, there is no definitive answer as to who really started the gunfight. Was it trigger-happy cops or angry cult members? One of the most popular claims was that there was confusion among ATF members, as they had heard a shot likely coming from their own side, but mistook it for gunfire from the Davidians, causing them to open fire on the compound. This theory also posits that the ATF members who were shot were shot by friendly fire, as a result of the confusion at the time, although the investigation claims otherwise. Either or, well, some is right. How do you feel when you hear some people, even on this panel, sort of saying, well, it's unclear who fired first? <clears throat> Congressman, I respect Congress and their rights to ask those questions, but <clears throat> I know they get that information from people, and I'm just sickened by it. It wouldn't be allowed in a court of law. It's not the facts. We didn't shoot first. We didn't. The survivors, on the other hand, have another story. He was shown all over the building and how the, so many of the shots had come in, and he said he was totally convinced that uh, the... Uh, ATF shot first from the evidence that he saw all the bullet holes coming in from his the fire, on the other hand, was likely a lead contributor to most of the deaths at Waco, because unlike the gunfight, the fire and smoke did not care whether you were fighting back or not. This smoke suffocated men, women, and children alike. 
uh, the Branch Davidians started the fire. We proved so conclusively that the Branch Davidians started the fire that two, at least two defense counsel conceded it during closing argument. We proved it through direct testimony of, of uh, experts. We threw, proved it through... ...is that the methylene chloride that was injected into Mount Carmel with the ferret rounds, that it's vaporous or flammable. It establishes methylene chloride is dangerous. You should not throw it inside of buildings, its manufacturer says. What sets Waco apart from other American cult incidents was the immense controversy that surrounded the raid and the circumstances of the deaths that took place. Could these have been avoided if the ATF did not escalate their involvement? Or was the intervention justified? Questions like these have followed the FBI since their involvement at Waco and has made the event a topic of national concern.